Please join me in welcoming Dr. Craig Smith. Thank you, Susan. Thank you very much. And I see some familiar faces, and for those of you who have been here before, I thank you again for doing me the great honor of coming and hearing me again. Many thanks. So today I'd like to talk about lightning, and lightning is a dangerous and capricious killer. Now this is a boy, a uh, young boy who was standing on a football field. Uh, lightning hit a pole, and the, the current jumped uh, to this young man. He survived, but it uh, impacted his shoulder, exited through the bottom of his foot, and you can see what his shoe looked like when that was all done. So lightning is very dangerous. In the United States, we have 50 to 100 people uh, die from lightning per year. Globally, it's more like 10 to 20,000 people. And uh, what's interesting to me or, was that of 10 people that get hit by lightning, three die immediately, but another three die uh, two, three, four years later from the lingering effects of it. And that's something I certainly wasn't aware of and most people are not aware of. Uh, we owe our first understanding of lightning as an electrical phenomena to Benjamin Franklin. Of course, a great American uh, scientist as well as statesman. He not only uh, discovered that lightning was electrical in nature and devised experiments to prove it, uh, but he also did a lot of basic things that, uh, in terms of the properties of electricity that hold true today. So we would like to duplicate an uh, element of Franklin's experiment for you right now. Uh, I'd like to introduce my electrifying assistant, <laughs> Emily Kane, who bravely volunteers to help me with this. And uh, this is a Tesla coil, which we're going to uh, demonstrate. So... Uh, Emily will hoist the kite. Here you see the key dangling here. Uh, this is uh, Franklin, remember, held the key. Uh, I uh, will definitely not plan to do that and hold that wire. Okay, are you ready, Emily? Up a little higher if you can. Oops. Well, like all things, you know, you have to plug it in. <laughs> Okay, are we ready? Uh, our key is not cooperating here. So, uh, lucky for Franklin that he did not get killed. There were some people that tried to repeat his experiments uh, and actually did get killed. Franklin didn't devise the kite experiment till later. He was going to do this experiment, which was called the Sentry Box Experiment. He described this in great detail in a book that was published, and it was actually done in France before he got around to doing it. Franklin was waiting for a church to be, uh, be completed in Philadelphia to do this experiment. And a Frenchman named Alibard did it and proved Franklin's theory. He then later did the kite experiment. Uh, later on, in the, towards the end of the 1800s, Nikola Tesla developed a lot of fundamental discoveries in alternating current theory, which make uh, electric motors practical. And he also uh, built the Tesla coil, which you just saw us demonstrate. Now, what Tesla's idea was is that he was going to transmit large amounts of electrical power uh, wirelessly. And, in fact, we can do that, and Emily and I will demonstrate that in a moment. But that was really a failure because of the losses. It took uh, an Italian named Marconi to recognize the true benefit of what Tesla's inventions permitted, and that was communication. And so... We know uh, 
from history what happened after that, and of course gave rise to wireless communications. So we're going to do several experiments here to demonstrate, however, Tesla's idea of wireless transmission of power. So we will... Are you ready? So you notice the light lights. We didn't really need to have any wires connecting it. And um, now we're going to put a uh, here again. This is a, uh, a light, no wires connecting it. And this is a metal halide lamp, one of the new lamps you might have in your house that's uh, very efficient in terms of power, it uses a small amount of electricity. What happens, you can see the streamers coming right through the glass out of there. And then here's another. This, this is uh, a common, ordinary household lamp. You don't really need to even screw it in, I'm really. Uh, and they're filled with an inert gas, argon gas, which makes the filament last longer, so you get more hours. But look what happens when you hit it with a high voltage. It forms a plasma inside this, Be very beautiful. Oh! <laughs> Unbreakable, thank God. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, for the uh, last experiment, it's up right up there. <laughs> okay, that'll help your studies, Emily. <laughs> Emily is the fourth assistant I've had, by the way. <laughs> uh, she's actually been with me twice now, so we're doing really good. Um, in the 1900s, people began making serious measurements about lightning, and the Empire State Building was actually instrumented uh, for lightning by General Electric Company, and a lot of basic data was gathered. Uh, it gets hit about 100 times per year, and uh, it's Done, it's designed so that that doesn't create a problem. This was a really interesting photograph. Somebody was trying to take a picture of lightning hitting the Empire State Building, and inadvertently they captured this airplane. I don't know, can you see this airplane flying overhead? Also got hit by the same bolt of lightning. Now, in the uh, late... Uh, 1900s, uh, 1990, 95, some researchers at Florida, the University of Florida, started using solid propellant rockets to trigger lightning. And this uh, was really interesting. Here you can see what the rockets look like. That's the launch stand over on the left. So the idea is to shoot this rocket up into a thundercloud, trailing a very small copper wire. And the wire connects to the top of this uh, up here connects to here, and then there's a big cable that goes down to an experimental house or whatever it is they wanted to test. So by firing these uh, rockets up into the cloud, the wire forms a path for the lightning to come back down, and uh, you get something that looks like this. So the rocket goes up, and then you can see here four different return strokes. So four strokes came, and they're slightly spaced apart because the cloud that produced them is moving under the force of the wind. Now, I'll do a, show a video of that. I'll have to watch it again. You have to look real carefully. You see the rocket go up and then the flash comes back almost instantly. And uh, here's another one. <coughs> these, are, these happen so quickly it's hard to see. You'll see, here's the launch tower. You'll see the rocket go up. You'll see the lightning come back. And then over to your right, you'll see some flashing on the ground from whatever the experiment was that was being tested. Oops, sorry. 
Try that again. So you saw the rocket, then the flash. So lightning can strike easily 10 miles, and sometimes it comes out in advance of a storm, or a storm could pass, and it could strike back backwards from the storm. As I was writing this book, uh, there were two incidences involving Boy Scouts, one here in California, and it occurred in July, and the Scouts were hiking up to Mount Whitney, which you see there in the background, and it started to rain, so they set up tents here in this meadow, and unfortunately, lightning hit one of the tents and killed the uh, one scout, the scout leader, and injured several others. Now, this for that to happen, four things need to occur. First, there has to be a thunderstorm. There's, there's no lightning without thunderstorms. Clouds have to de get a degree of electrification. We'll talk about that in a moment. The voltage has to be high enough to overcome the resistance of the air so that current will flow to the ground. And then con conditions on the ground have to also be such that lightning uh, can flow to Earth, to or from Earth. So what happens is that on warm days, warm air starts rising, and as it gets up to high altitudes, it uh, begins to uh, freeze. Water vapor in the cloud, in the rising air, freezes, because as you get up to high enough altitude, uh, this is 10 kilometers, about six miles high, then the temperature drops to minus 50 degrees, and so the water droplets form small uh, granules of ice, and they begin to fall by gravity back down through the corridor or column of rising warm air. And as they do that, they strip electrons off the rising molecules. So you end up with parts of the cloud being charged positively and part of it charged negatively, and that creates a difference in potential. And when that voltage is high enough to overcome the resistance of air, then you can have lightning. So it takes about 8,000 volts to jump uh, the gap in a spark plug in your car. It takes about 30,000 to 70,000 volts to jump one inch in air at standard temperature and pressure. Uh, you can see we were making sparks that are 8 or 10 inches long. So multiply 8 or 10 times this, you get an idea what voltage is on that coil. Another interesting thing, which I'll demonstrate a little later on, is that every plant, tree, blade of grass uh, on the Earth's surface is constantly leaking electrons into the atmosphere. Physicists calculate that if nothing happened, the Earth would discharge in several days. It would be analogous to your leaving the headlights on in your car until your battery runs down. No one really knows what that would do. Uh, the suspicion is certainly that it would interfere with all types of radio and electronic communications. But beyond that, we don't know what it would really do. The amazing thing is, though, that it's lightning, the flashes of lightning, thousands of flashes every second around the world that return those electrons to the Earth and maintain the electrical balance of the Earth. The uh, average strike is about a half inch wide in the air. Uh, it may carry a, uh, 10 million volts or more. Uh, it, the current can be 30,000 to 100,000 amperes. Instantaneous power is huge, uh, more than or equivalent to 10 nuclear power plants. But it's such a short duration that there's no practical value of it. There are four common uh, forms of lightning strikes. Most common are downward strikes, 90% uh, of the time lowering negative charge, sometimes positive charge. And then there are upward strikes that occur typically from tall buildings or mountaintops. Different types of lightning, uh, sheet lightning, or what some people refer to as heat lightning, is typically a strike within a cloud or between two clouds. It doesn't come to the ground. Only about one-fourth of the lightning strikes that you see actually come to the ground, and those are the only ones that we really care about. Uh, ribbon lightning 
is uh, something like, uh, like this. This is bead, called bead lightning or ribbon lightning, where the clouds are moving and it broadens out what you see, or where the wind moves and breaks up the, the uh, appearance of the strike. The strangest one is ball lightning, and this uh, is something there have been whole books written about. No one really knows what causes ball lightning. Uh, but as an example, and I've talked to people that have actually observed this, uh, reliable witnesses such as pilots of commercial airplanes, where ball lightning has hit the windshield of an airplane, passed through it, gone down the aisle of the plane and out the back end without injuring anybody, visible to hundreds of observers, and it, described as a round sphere, maybe basketball size, orange colored, kind of moving slowly, maybe like about that fast. Some people hear a hissing sound with it, some people feel heat. Uh, but at any rate, uh, this is one example where someone was injured, uh, people gathered inside a house during a thunderstorm, ball lightning, uh, hit the door, came through the door, touched this young woman's head, uh, she slumped over, it bounced through the room, went into another room, uh, as it says, singed the man's boots, ran by his boots, uh, smashed the stove, exited through a window. Uh, there have been other versions where hit a stove, caused water to boil, and then went out. Uh, in this case, a woman died. So the process uh, by which lightning uh, comes to the earth is a complex one, and there's still a lot that we don't know about it, but the basic process is that uh, what's called a step leader will come down in this jagged form. So it goes, and this happens all very quickly, of course, but it goes to some point, turns direction, goes to another point, and so on, eventually reaches ground. And that initial step leader carries a very small current. Um, but what it does, and why does it do this jagged stuff? No one really knows. Somehow, somehow it appears that it goes to a certain point, interacts with the molecules of the air, maybe causes a burst of electrons, which causes it to go in a different direction. But at any rate, it creates an ionized path as it reaches the Earth. And this is analogous to the copper wire hanging from the, down from the rocket with, when rockets are used to trigger lightning. When that happens, then there is a return stroke going up from the ground. And this, this carries a lot of current and can be dangerous or do a lot of damage. And after that first return stroke, then there is another stroke from the cloud down to the ground which is now called a dart leader, because it basically just darts straight down. It doesn't have to do all this bouncing around. And then there's another return stroke. There could be as many as 10 return strokes. Typically, there's four. And so what you might see, if the cloud is moving, these would be hitting here, and then here, and then here, uh, if the cloud is moving due to wind. There is also a lightning phenomenon in the upper atmosphere. Uh, this is well above the area where uh, commercial airlines fly. Blue jets, red sprites, these are seen from the space station and space shuttle. And also on other planets, there's evidence of lightning, most likely on Jupiter. Venus, the data is ambiguous. Can lightning strike twice? Well, you already know the answer to that, right? Because I said it could hit the, the Empire State Building 100 times a year. Uh, but really strange is uh, hitting a beach in New York, August 8, 1937. Three people died. A year later, almost to the day, lightning struck the same beach. Three more people died. Uh, so say the morale of that or moral of that is when lightning finds a spike spot where it likes uh, to hit, it's going to hit it more than once. California, we don't have a lot of lightning. Uh, we're fortunate in that regard. Uh, one measure of lightning that is what's defined as a thunderstorm day, a day in which there is uh, a thunderstorm is heard, one or, or more. 
So in California, we have about five thunderstorm days per year. And the lightning capital of the US is here in uh, Florida, which has about 130 in central and northern Florida. Uh, about 20 years ago, we started putting in an instrumentation system across the North uh, American continent, the US and Canada. And now, today, there are instruments that measure lightning uh, strikes on the ground. And so you can get these kind of uh, graphs now that show how frequently lightning is hitting in a given area. So the highest density, of course, is the red here in Florida and the southeastern United States. But notice there's some pockets up here in Colorado, northern New Mexico, uh, and of course the Midwest where lightning occurs uh, much more frequently than California. Uh, when does this occur? Uh, July turns out to be the month when there are the most fatalities and injuries due to lightning. So I say if you're born under the sign of crabs or Leo, uh, watch out. And you notice the Boy Scout incident I described earlier, that was July. This is a family reunion that took place in uh, Pennsylvania in July. About 100 people getting together. Rain started to fall. They run and get under a big pine tree. Lightning hits the tree, jumps to the people. 30 people were injured. One boy was in a coma for several weeks, uh, but survived. Now, height has an effect on lightning. So tall structures uh, above about uh, uh, 1,600 feet, the, the strike will go up. Below about 330 feet, below the height of about 100 meters, the strike is almost invariably downwards. And in between, it could be either way. So you see this happening with tall structures and also in tall mountains. This is one particularly interesting case where a group of people were climbing Grand Teton, climbing up this peak, and they had a base camp at about 12,000 feet and left early in the morning to climb up to the peak before the afternoon thunderstorms came. Unfortunately, they were delayed by some other climbers, and so it took them longer. And when they reached uh, an area here short of the peak, they heard a buzzing sound, and hair was standing up, and suddenly they were hit uh, by lightning, which killed one woman, injured her husband, injured several other people. Some people fell down a considerable distance. One guy was left hanging uh, over a chasm from his uh, rope harness uh, with serious injuries. He was eventually retrieved, and they were uh, taken off the mountain by a helicopter. So what are the odds that you might be hit by lightning? Uh, men get hit five times as often as women. I'm sure there's some biblical inferences that one could derive from that. <laughs> uh, 20 to 29 years of age is the highest death rate. Uh, so that's guys that are out there determined to finish that last round of golf. Uh, most deaths occur in the afternoon. Well, that's obvious because that's when thunderstorms occur. The air has to heat up for a thunderstorm. Now, this is interesting. Most deaths on Sunday followed by Saturday. Well, okay, you can sort of figure that out. That's weekend activities, right? Now, maybe if they were in church, it would be different. <laughs> but then Wednesday. Now, why Wednesday? The only reason I could think for Wednesday is that that's when my dentist takes off. <laughs> Maybe all these dentists are out there playing golf. I don't know. Where does it happen? Uh, primarily out in open fields. I say except golf because I kept golf out of that. Uh, Water-related or under trees. People run under trees when it starts to rain. The tree gets hit, and then they get hit. Uh, Water-related, boats swimming. Don't want to be out in the water when it's thundering. Operating, uh, well, golf. 5% of the deaths and injuries occur to golfers. Operating heavy equipment, tractors, you know, people working out in agriculture. Using a telephone, talking on the telephone during a thunderstorm. Uh, cell phones are okay, but wired tel telephones are not. Uh, for example, this was an electrician in Tennessee who I interviewed. 
he, uh, he was, knew about thunderstorm, knew about lightning, so he, uh, in the midst of a approaching thunderstorm, he disconnected the antenna from his TV and was going to hook up his rabbit ear antenna, uh, which all was a wise move because he wanted to see what the weather report said. But unfortunately, his television's here, the wire antenna's hanging down here, and he's standing there trying to hook up the rabbit ears. Lightning hit the antenna, came down the wire, jumped to his leg. Uh, he was all right for a while, but uh, kept getting worse and worse, and eventually had to close his business and uh, retire with a full disability after three years. Um, here's a group of cattle out in the open uh, in a thunderstorm, lightning hit the fence. There you have a whole bunch of hamburger now, pre-cooked. Uh, I've seen pictures like this of herds of elk, a chicken ranch hit by lightning, 17,000 chickens ready for the kernel. Uh, even five elephants in India, one strike of lightning. Why is it so deadly with animals? Well, the big difference is animals have four legs. And that leads to a condition called step voltage. So if lightning hits the ground or hits a post or a fence post that conducts a current into the ground, it will flow out away from that point depending on the resistance of the ground. And as it flows away, the voltage drops. So at this point, let's say the hind leg of the elephant is standing at a point where it's 100,000 volts. And here it's only 800,000 volts. So there's a 200,000 volt difference from front to back legs, which means a big current flows through the body of the elephant. And of course, with a four-legged animal, if you go in the front legs and come out the back legs or vice versa, you're going right through all the vital organs. So uh, that can happen with humans as well. But with two legs, we don't necessarily expose all the vital organs. So when lightning does hit the ground, this is a strike that was photographed by a friend of mine out uh, near uh, Palm Springs in the desert. And what happens is it often creates something called fulgurites. And fulgurite is uh, the trace of lightning in the soil. So this sample actually came from Florida. And you can see that path, that the lightning moving through wet sand uh, simply melted the sand and fused it into glass. And you can see the actual pattern of the lightning. That piece was about 20 feet long. Uh, also, lightning hits uh, iron-bearing rock in the mountains and tends to magnetize it. And it's interesting that uh, people have found these petroglyphs in California and Oregon uh, all made over rocks that have been magnetized by lightning strikes. So you wonder what is obviously some magic or religious beliefs there that the Indians who did these petroglyphs saw the lightning strike and associated some magical power with that particular location. So let's talk about sensitivity uh, of elect to electricity of human beings. About a half a milliamp, a half a thousandth of an amp will, will startle you if you feel it. Uh, five to ten milliamps will actually, in some cases, cause your muscles to contract and you, if you grab the hot wire, you couldn't let loose. Fifty to a hundred milliamps can stop your heart. And by comparison then, 833 milliamps is the normal current in a 100 watt light bulb in your house. So you can see these are relatively small currents that have a serious effect on the human body. And what does lightning current have? In terms of the same units, 5,000 to 5 million milliamps. So when you see the disparity in those numbers, you say, well, how could anybody survive? But a lot of people do. And I'll show you why that is later. What does it do uh, to humans? The primary effect that we're concerned about is on the cardiorespiratory system, you know, impact on heart and lung. It can also affect the brain and nervous system, skin, burns, you know, other uh, trauma. A lot of people have ear hearing problems after getting hit by lightning, and uh, psychiatric and psychological impacts can occur as well. 
So what happens normally is that lightning causes ventricular fibrillation, which stops the flow of blood from the heart, and a person passes out. Uh, sometimes when they fall down, it actually restarts their heart. Uh, but if not, and uh, you find somebody that's been hit by lightning or you know of some this happening, very important to give them immediate CPR. Most people can be saved if they get immediate CPR. So what happens, this is the sketch of the heart. Uh, here's the ventricle. So blood flows down, and this little gland here produces a minute electrical signal that causes the ventricle to to compress and pump blood uh, to your lungs so it becomes oxygenated. And uh, so a normal electrocardiogram would look like this, where this is the signal, this is the voltage telling the ventricle right here, okay, it's time to compress and pump, and then recover and pump again, and so on. Uh, when there's ventricular fibrillation, this is what the electrocardiogram looks like. And what that means is that the ventricle is just sitting there kind of quivering. It's not really producing any pressure to, to pump blood. So if that situation isn't, isn't remedied uh, pretty quickly, the victim is going to die. Other effects, uh, you can have uh, amnesia, frequent headaches. The people I interviewed a lot of times had memory problems difficulty sleeping, uh, some had burns on their skin, uh, puncture wounds, like the young man in the first slide I showed, there was a puncture wound where lightning exited from his foot, hearing problems, and even psychiatric and psychological impacts, much like post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, lightning also affects our infrastructure, bridges, buildings, and sensitive facilities. And uh, we estimate in the U.S. about $5 billion a year loss of uh, due to lightning, much of that associated with electric utility system. But there's a growing problem, uh, and that is with personal computers and all the electronic devices that we have in homes today, which are using very small, low-voltage objects devices that uh, are very sensitive to sudden surges in voltage. So in a typical residence or building, lightning could get into the building through the, u the utility systems, power, telephone, underground utilities, antennas, just a direct strike, hit a tree, jump to the building. And so if you live in a lightning-prone area, you need to have lightning rods and protection uh, to carry that current to the ground and protect the structure. Here was another interesting example. Uh, this young lady, seven years old, uh, was sleeping in her bed uh, in a thunderstorm. Lightning hit the roof of the house, followed uh, an electrical conduit in the attic here down to here, and at this place, it jumped to this corner of the drywall. That corner is protected with a metal angle strip coming down. So it came down that metal, jumped to the metal frame of her bed. And fortunately, it didn't hurt her, but it set the mattress on fire. And so everybody is all excited about the noise and, and the smoke and fire. She jumped out of bed. Her father came up and dragged the mattress downstairs and put it outside and put it out, and other than that, everybody was okay. This made the local news, and I saw her being interviewed on television, and the reporter was asking her about this, and, and uh, so she's describing what happened. My dad came and took the mattress outside, put the fire out, and the reporter said, well, what happened then? I said, well, my dad said a lot of bad words. <laughs> So uh, bridges frequently get hit. They're, again, designed to not, normally that's not a problem. Airplanes frequently get hit. This is a very dramatic photo of a plane taking off from an airport in Japan. Uh, I couldn't get the video on here, unfortunately, but you could go look at it if you want. Uh, but you can see the plane's taking off, and all of a sudden it's uh, hit by lightning. 
Uh, on the average, every commercial airliner gets hit by lightning uh, once per year on average. And normally it's not a problem uh, because of the way planes are designed today. There's a lot of concern about uh, NASA launching the space shuttle and satellites in uh, Florida because of the preponderance of lightning there. Uh, lightning can have effects on boats, but normally uh, lightning strikes less frequently over the water, over oceans. But it can hit boats. This is a hit on a sailboat. This is a friend of mine who was in this boat uh, getting ready for a race in Connecticut, or off in New York, actually. And he had a crew of teenagers on board. And uh, they're getting ready for the race to start, and it's starting to rain. And so he's holding back. He didn't go out to the starting line. He wanted to wait to see if the weather was going to clear. And took advantage of the delay to go down in the head and uh, uh, relieve himself. And while he's there, here's this loud crash and comes running up and finds that the boat had been hit by lightning. Parts of it were smoking. He put out the fire, and no one was hurt but he had a lot of damage to most of his electronics. And he was telling me about this, and he was saying afterwards, well, it could have been a lot worse, you know. I could have hit me when I was down there with my pants down. <laughs> uh, refineries uh, get hit if they don't have the right kind of protection. And power plants and those types of facilities need uh, lightning protection as do our uh, transmission lines, electrical distribution systems. Typically, they have this conductor up above the current carrying lines, and this is uh, basically a lightning arrester. So hopefully, lightning strikes that conductor and goes and then is conducted to ground. Uh, what do you need to do to protect a, a structure against lightning? You need to have an air terminal that the lightning will hit, a means to conduct a current from the air terminal down to the ground, and then a good grounding system so that you, it provides the lowest resistance path to ground. And that's why I say that lightning is so ubiquitous, because it will, on its own, find the lowest path, lowest resistant path to ground. And if you happen to be in the way, not a good thing. So let's do a couple more experiments. Emily, if you're up for this. And uh, I want to illustrate some of these hazards. So we'll start out with uh, water. And you know you wouldn't want to be standing in water around electricity. But normally you think of water as not being something that's going to be a problem with electricity. But we'll put some water there. So, uh, so you see the electricity goes at that voltage goes right through the water. Doesn't mind it at all. Now another thing. I mentioned earlier uh, about talking on the telephone. Cell phones are fine. I'll do this one. <laughs> but uh, you definitely wouldn't want to be holding this to your ear in a th Okay, this is a little piece of printed circuit board out of a out of a uh, part of a of a computer, and you can kind of get an idea why uh, lightning is not friendly to. Okay, lastly, the little tree, and. Uh, you saw before what lightning can do to trees and how trees can, uh, if lightning hits a tree, it can jump to individuals standing by, or trees literally can explode. This one is not going to explode, by the way. But also you can see how...
streamers that come off from that and illustrate how lightning or how electrons leak into the air. What happens when lightning hits a tree, interestingly enough, is that the current is so hot as it flows through the tree that the sap or any water in the trunk or branches are instantly turned to steam and the wood just literally explodes. And so people have been standing near trees that were hit by lightning and they didn't have any electrical problem, but the steam explosion knocked them 10 feet away. So again, is this a good scene here? No. <laughs> you don't want to be in that swimming pool when it's lightning, I mean, it's thundering uh, like that. So some of the things that we've talked about so far are direct strikes. Uh, here's a golfer holding his little golfing lightning rod up in the air. <laughs> not going to, probably not going to survive that. That's the case where I said the range of currents can be 5,000 milliamps to 5 million milliamps. This is going to be more like 5 million milliamps. Uh, this is a, what's called a flashover, and this happens a lot of times, and these people have a better chance of surviving because the lightning will hit them, but then instead of going through the body, it jumps to the surface and goes down the outside of their body. It might cause burns and so on, but the current actually in their body is going to be substantially less because of this flashover, the voltage uh, at the point where the lightning strikes drops instantly, and that's what saves their, their lives. Uh, a side flash from a tree or building, talking on a phone. Uh, here's somebody walking, and you can see the possibilities of step voltage. And then finally, we want to talk about the lightning crouch, sort of the last desperate measure. So stay out of, away from trees when there's thunderstorms. Uh, here you can see a tree being literally incinerated by a bolt of lightning. Uh, stay off golf courses. A lot of golf courses today have warning systems, uh, but there are still people that say they're going to finish this round. Let's finish this round before we head for the clubhouse. Uh, this could be the result. You wouldn't want to be holding the pin at that particular moment. And so um, the lightning crouch, uh, this is if you're in the open, you can't get to a car or a building, and your hair is beginning to stand on end, or you hear some crackling or buzzing sounds. Then what you want to do is have your feet right together, no step voltage, get down as low as possible, but only one point on the ground, which is your feet, cover your ears, try to protect your hearing, and then pray to all the gods there are. <laughs> uh, there used to be a rule, uh, the 30-30 rule. So how many have heard of that? Anybody raise your hand? Right. So. You, uh, you, you hear, hear thunder, count to 30. If you see lightning, then uh, you want to get into shelter because that tells you it's five miles away. Uh, and then the second 30 means don't uh, come out until 30 minutes after the last thunder you hear. Well, we've gone away from that now because there's possibilities you could hear thunder and see lightning, but they could be two different uh, sources, so maybe it's not so far away, and five miles is really not enough. Lightning can strike you ten miles away, and you can't hear thunder more than a maximum of about 15 miles away at, under the best of condition. So today what they, they say, the weather service is now saying, when thunder roars, get indoors. So at the first sign of any thunder, uh, get in the shelter in a substantial building or in a car. So I think I'll stop at this point. Uh, we have time for some questions. And again, I thank you very much for coming uh, tonight.